Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Fringe North podcast. My name is Caitlin Townsend. My pronouns are she and her, and I am the project coordinator for this year's festival. And I have with me here today, Monica. Monica, would you like to take a minute to just introduce yourself and to share a little bit about the festival submission for this year's festival? Sure, thank you. I'm Monica Dufo. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the artistic director of Carousel Players, which is a theater company based in the Niagara region of Ontario. And um, the piece that we've submitted this year is called Happy Birthday to Me. It's a short digital play, especially for kids. And we've been touring it, touring it, I say, but <laughs> it's been presented in schools in the Niagara region and in other places as well this year uh, for kids in grades four to six. That's really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the premise of this submission and like uh, how, like, I guess a little bit about the plot without giving too much away, but just so that people know what they're coming to see. Yeah. Well, the plot is really, it's about a, a girl who's having an 11th birthday party. And um, I, I conceived of this piece early in the pandemic, probably about July or August of 2020, I started to write it. And at that time, as I was writing it, I was thinking, well, what will it be like for kids? Because parents were being asked to decide at that point, parents in Ontario anyway, whether their child would go to school in person or whether their child would be doing virtual learning. Um, so I imagined a group of friends who uh, one of whom was being uh, kept at home to learn at home and the others who were going back to school. And what would that be like for a friendship of kids who are about 11 or 12 years old to, to not be able to be together? So that's sort of the premise of the piece. Okay, so if I hear correctly, like one of the students isn't and all the other three are actually interacting in, in life as well. So it's sort of this, um, I guess, feeling of extra isolation compared to uh, how some of the other kids might have been feeling in COVID. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the, the idea is that this one kid has a, her family has an, she's got a large extended family who live with her. And so they're, the older people are at higher risk. So her family has decided that their children would learn from home, which was a common decision for lots of parents. Um, so her friends have gone back to school and it's set in September of 2020. So um, just when when school, all the new ways of being at school were being discovered and understood mm. by kids. Um, and it's funny, when we started to work on it, I was concerned that, well, what if the pandemic ends, <laughs> you know, in October, and we don't need to isolate anymore? Will this have any relevance anymore? But but as the year went on and as the school year became disrupted again and again in Ontario anyway, um, it became even more relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's very timely and very exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in terms of your process as a writer, as you were exploring this material, uh, were you kind of trying to get inside the head of the kids or sort of giving like a top down approach view? Uh, definitely trying to get inside the head of the kids. Um, so I'm a mother of three kids, but I've also worked a lot in schools as a drama educator and as an actor performing in, in shows that tour to schools. So I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of kids at this age. And I was curious about this age in particular because it's sort of the time when kids are feeling drawn to be, some kids are like, I want to be a teenager. And some kids are like, no, I'm still a kid. And so there's this interesting dynamic. And within this group of four friends, we see some of the kids are sort of leaning more towards teenage qualities and thoughts and ideas. And others are more leaning towards the kid side. And so that, that's another tension within this, this friend group, which I thought was interesting to explore. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing that I really thought about uh, kids who, have been accustomed to having friends since they were in kindergarten. You know, this is a group of friends who've been together since they were very, very young. And what would that be like to suddenly one person in that group, that very tight knit group of people is not able to see her friends, not even, not even able to just sort of see them at school. Um, so that, as you were saying earlier, that kind of extra isolation that can happen within that and I think we were able to achieve some of, you know, to explore that in an interesting way within the piece. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so when you're approaching that, does the piece uh, kind of look at the collective or does it separate characters out at different points so that we can see kind of what's going on in their individual heads as well? Or is it more about the dynamics of the group as a whole? Yeah, it's it's really more about the dynamics of the group because it's set up like a Zoom call. So it's like this one character is Alexandra is celebrating her birthday. She's invited her friends to her virtual Zoom birthday party. So that's the way that they're able to interact. And again, we said it sort of at the beginning of, of the pandemic or <laughs> in September, which didn't feel like the beginning then, but <laughs> in, in retrospect is kind of the beginning um, in September of 2020. So that they're still getting used to, you know, interacting through, through Zoom or some other online uh, interface. Um, and there are times where we see only two characters together or only one character, but but most of it is is all four of them. And uh, in, you know, in any group of friends, different people react differently to times of crisis or stress. And so we see the differences between these four young people too. And they talk about silly things, but they also talk about some serious things. Um, and I think what I was curious about is really how how do kids figure out a way to maintain connections even in this time? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's the arc of the pieces. How do these four friends find a way to still maintain their friendship? Oh, that sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so when, uh, like for our audience who are watching right now, is it directed more at kids to help them cope through or is it kind of uh, a storyline that speaks to parents too and that they can kind of get a better feel for where their kids are at? What was your approach with that and who are you planning to target with this? Yeah, I think this piece, um, we really thought about bringing it to schools, to classrooms, whether it was a virtual classroom or an in-school classroom. So we were thinking about kids first, but of course we also always expect adults to be viewing our work. So whether that's teachers or parents, or we sent, I know a, a group of girl guides watched the, the show as a group. And so their, their leaders also were really interested in the piece. I think there's an opportunity for insight really for kids uh, who are you know between nine and 12, 14, something like that, but also for parents to see it as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really exciting. And mm -hmm. ha being a parent yourself and kind of navigating the pan pandemic and making these choices around like, what is the best choice for my kid in this circumstance? And how do you navigate that with um, other parents? And so when you're considering all of that, um, and having experienced it sort of yourself, um, what highlights uh, show up in terms of uh, in the content itself with like how kids sometimes don't understand like why their parents are making the decisions they are or sometimes they do but they don't necessarily fully agree with them we'll word it that way um yeah. so you get like that so how how did you incorporate some of your own life experiences around that into this piece well i just saw you know pa parents all around me making that choice about how are my how are my kids going to still attend school mm -hmm. and i think that was that was the, the question that spurred me to write this piece. Um, so although we never see any parents in the play, the kids all refer to their families and to their siblings and to their parents and how each parent or each family made different decisions for their kids, which was something that I observed absolutely. You know, different families were making different choices about how they would maintain uh, relationships with their with their extended family, how they would maintain relationships with families, you know. So in the in the piece, we see um, one family is very strict, and no, they're they're not allowed to see anyone outside of their household, and another family is a little more relaxed about it, and they're allowed to see extended family, and you know, beyond that. So I think that's something that kids. I I thought it was important that kids see. Um, how different families have coped with this situation and that, that there's no one right way, you know, but there's, there are different ways that we all figured out how to, how to maintain our relationships with our family, but also how to, you know, be whole as a family. Um, so those are some of the things that I was thinking about and I think that have been incorporated into the piece as well. 
Yeah, for sure. And I think it's so cool that um, like kids get to see, because often when it is like a, a friend group of four, you feel like your family is the only one doing it that way. But this allows them to see that, no, there are other families for having similar approaches. And I'm not mm -hmm. the only one just because I'm the only one in my friend group. And those different pieces are, are really um, important during this time, especially for kids who like some kids have a level of comprehension around what's going on and then other kids are a little bit uh, just naive I mean that that's part of childhood sometimes so uh, to, for them to be able to engage with this material in that way and to see that it's it's normal uh, the choices that their parents are making mm -hmm. yeah I think that's that's something that I was striving for is to offer some kind of a forum for kids to think about these things and to check in to sort of say okay so how is my family within this spectrum do you know mm -hmm. but also um to understand that that there is no as i said before there's no right way there's each of us has found a different way to cope and each of us has found a different way to to maintain our friendships um and to find joy you know in this time and i think that's another thing that i was really interested in with this piece is to see these these four kids who know each other so well they have shorthand they have nicknames for each other and they um they have a party they celebrate each other during this and you know they there's an opportunity for one kid to kind of gross out the other ones and um an opportunity for them to dance to some music and so we really do see at the beginning, it's a little tense. They haven't seen each other for a while. They let go of that tension eventually. And, and then they celebrate, which is what we all need to do, right? <laughs> at least I think so. Yeah, it's so important during this time to find like those, those moments of joy and just uh, to see that, you know, life isn't black and white. There's, there's good and bad in every circumstance. So to, to see uh, the good of the situation and the uniqueness of it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so how have you been using this to like tour around schools or like not physically but to share around <laughs> schools and that uh, what has been some of the feedback that you've received and how have kids have been engaging with it yeah so we started to tour it uh to to make it available to schools um in january of 2021 um and i will say that we we didn't anticipate as much technical difficulty for teachers to just mm -hmm. access the piece you know we made it available through forums like YouTube and, and Vimeo, but because some kids were learning from home and some teachers were remote from the school themselves, we actually discovered that it was challenging for some teachers to be able to just bring the piece to the students, you know? So we, we, troublesho we did some troubleshooting and figured out a way to do that. Um, so the, the response from the kids, the one thing that I really miss is when we perform in schools, I can be there, I can see mm -hmm. the, the audience, I can hear their reaction. And of course we can't do that right now. So it's a little bit, you know, the reaction is filtered through a teacher's response to us. But we've had some wonderful feedback from teachers. And Good. as I was mentioning that Girl Guide Troop who saw the piece, uh, I think that was in March, they really, really enjoyed it. Um, uh, I think what people have talked about is that it just feels so real, it feels mm -hmm. like my life it feels like what i've been experiencing um and teachers have enjoyed just the opportunity for kids to think about you know how we have changed how we have adapted how we have <clears throat> found ways to still communicate with each other um and so it's, those are some of the themes that we brought to schools and asked uh, teachers to sort of engage with and think about with their students that's mm -hmm. really exciting yeah. Um, I'm curious, like, if there is a specific reason for choosing Zoom for the um, characters to be engaging on, because I know there's like been a, so many different platforms that kids are <laughs> using. Uh, was that just because it was easiest to film on or was there, uh, was it tied to the storyline in some way to choose that particular program? Yeah, we don't really refer to it in the, sh in the piece, like what platform they're using. Um, but it it was the easiest for us to use to film on um it was just our our staff was most familiar with that that form and um it was easy to edit as well yeah. uh, which was really helpful mm -hmm. um i think I, I think that the reason i chose to to create the piece in that way is you know encountering some work 
especially early in the pandemic when theater artists were struggling to find how do I make how do I make theater on mm -hmm. online? Um, uh, you know, it's not film and it's not television. And um, I struggle to find where is my sense of theater in, in the work that I saw happening online. So I really wanted something that felt alive, like that it is a live conversation between these, these young characters, something that, um, that felt immediate, that there was no editing involved in, in the piece that we made. And that's how we shot it. We, you know, it's a Zoom meeting where one person starts the meeting, one of the young characters starts the meeting, the other characters arrive. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, at one point somebody's internet goes out and she disappears and then she comes back. And so it does feel like a, it, as unfiltered as possible. Mm -hmm. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, that's great. And yeah, it's been it's been fun to see how different theater companies adapt to like bring the heart of theater onto the screen, which I think is so important because it is very different than film or television. Um, and to keep that heart still an integral part of pieces has been really cool to see the different creative ways that people do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, this this was um, we're actually getting ready to make another digital piece now and it will be a little bit different it will feel like like a classroom like a digital classroom oh, cool. but i i i just find that the creativity of theater makers to to find ways to make this possible right mm -hmm. to to continue to have a fringe festival happening to continue to tour to schools remotely and <laughs> digitally um, I find it really encouraging that we can all do this. Yeah, it, it, it definitely highlights our creativity, I think, as artists. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so I'm curious, is this your first piece that you created in the pandemic or um, have you created other content and how, because it's um, like, I've been asking a lot of artists like how they've shifted to the online, but because it is a piece that's meant to look online, uh, did it make it a little bit easier than some of those other projects that you might have been involved in in the pandemic? Um, I would say yes. I mean, we filmed this, although it's set in September of 2020, we filmed it in November of 2020. Um, and, and then the editing process sort of took about a month. So as I mentioned, it wasn't ready until January for audiences. Um, I think we were inventing it as we did it, do you know, because I had never directed anything in this way or written anything for for that format before. Um, I think if I was doing it again now, I would probably make some changes to the way that it that it is that it either was written or the way that we directed it. But I am pretty happy with with the simplicity of it, do you know, mm -hmm. and, and the way ultimately the storytelling happens through the interaction between these four young characters. Um, and we, without really referring to things too much, we just know, oh, they're referring to how school is during the pandemic. They're referring to, you know, the, the early in the pandemic, we talked about, uh, you had a bubble that you could be in, right? done away with that language now, but that was what we talked about at the beginning. Um, so I think it's kind of like an interesting timestamp to where we were, um, you know, a few months ago and, and it, everyone will recognize all the things that they're talking about, like the fact that they have to wear masks in schools. That was a new thing in September, right? <laughs> now we're all pretty old hat about wearing masks all the time. But um, I think that yeah, when we look back years from now, it'll be an interesting sort of representation of this time. Um, I will say, I'm not sure that I really want to work in the digital <laughs> world in the future. I'm so looking forward to, you know, getting back into a, a, a gymnasium, which is where we usually present our work, mm -hmm. creating shows that are interactive and exciting for kids that are live. Um, I'm glad that I had the opportunity to make happy birthday to me, but I'm, I'm ready to, you know, revisit that live exchange that happens between an audience and, and actors. Mm -hmm, for sure. And it's just a different energy, I think, that surrounds that space. <laughs> it's a different energy and boy, do I miss the laughter of children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I cannot tell you how much 
I just want to be at the back of the gym and see kids enjoying a piece of theater that we've made for them, you know, mm -hmm. um, not just laugh, but all, but, but ultimately, you know, that, that ripple that goes through an audience when they're enjoying something, when they're engaged with something that's, mm -hmm. that's hard to capture through this yeah. format. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's definitely something that will be very much appreciative and not taken as granted as we used to. For <laughs> yeah, 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 we'll be treasuring that for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, so I am just noticing the time, so I want to make sure that before we wrap up, you have some space to share anything uh, that you want audience members to know about the piece or about uh, Carousel uh, Players has an organization um, before we have a chance to close off. So is there anything that you would want viewers to know? Um, about the piece itself, I would just say it's a, a joyful and... and um, yeah, it's a joyful way of thinking about friendship. Mm. Um, and I, I encourage uh, families to watch it together. I think that would be a great way to enjoy it. Mm. Um, as for Carousel Players, this is our 50th anniversary season that we're just starting now. So it's very exciting to know that we're going to be part of Fringe North in, in our 50th anniversary season. We'll also be doing uh, some touring this year. So most of our live in front of an audience performances will be happening uh, after the new year, but we um, will be doing a tour of a show called The Incredible Adventures of Mary Jane Mosquito by Thompson Highway, and it, it will be performed uh, throughout Northern Ontario, including Sault Ste. Marie, so I hope audiences will watch for that piece. Um, yeah, and I, I would just say, uh, check out our website. We have lots of activities for kids of all ages on our website. And we, we look forward to seeing audiences sometime very soon, we hope, <laughs> in person. That's awesome. Well, we're very excited to have you as part of our festival and we're looking forward to the piece. Um, for viewers who are watching, the festival is running from August 19th to the 22nd with a sneak preview on the 18th in the evening. Uh, so you can come out, buy tickets and support uh, the play Happy Birthday to Me, which is uh, all in in short. So HB yeah, 2D <laughs> HBD to me, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the acronym. So yeah, come on out and purchase a ticket and support Carousel Players. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Monica, for your time as well and for coming on the podcast today. We really appreciate it. And we hope to see you all at the festival. Thank you, merci, miigwech, and gracias. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you for watching our podcast. Merci, miigwech, gracias. If you like what we're doing, you can support Fringe North and the artists involved in this year's festival financially so that we can continue this work. Visit www.fringenorth.ca to find out more.